Arizona Wildlife Views, brought to you by the sale of hunting and fishing licenses, and the Heritage Fund, lottery dollars working for wildlife. Some projects are made possible by the Sport Fish and Wildlife Restoration Fund. Come along as we release California condors over the Vermilion Cliffs and return a herd of desert bighorn sheep to their native land. But first we go on a pronghorn antelope roundup near Prescott. And with the closing of the gate, another group of pronghorn began their journey to a new home. Game and fish biologists, working side by side with concerned sportsmen and women, captured a total of 67 pronghorn in the Granitel area of Prescott for release near Meteor Crater. This is private property that we are on. We were fortunate to obtain permission from the landowner to conduct this capture operation on this private property. The idea is to take some pronghorn from an area where populations are doing well and move them to an area where a population is recovering from decline or otherwise in need of support. This part of uh, Region 3 in the Prescott area is one of the most uh, productive areas in the state for antelope production and reproduction. The capture pen is divided in half by a tarp. Once the capture team is in position, the tarp is pulled back, allowing a few pronghorn to escape, or they are quickly subdued. Now you can see why capture personnel are affectionately called muggers. The action is fast and furious. Capturing a scared wild animal and wrestling it to the ground is extremely dangerous, and not for the faint of heart. Well, when those antelope get loose in that trap, their whole goal is to try to get out of there. So they're jumping and they're thrashing and they're running around. If you have any loose items on your clothing, loose pockets, badges, or, or anything, then you know they can just rip those right off. So you don't really want their legs or horns or anything else catching on you. You also have to be really cautious around the bucks or even the does. They can thrash their heads around and their horns can be pretty sharp so they can cause injury. The quicker they are subdued, the least amount of harm can be done to both the pronghorn and the muggers. Once they're on the ground, the first order of business is to cover their eyes to help minimize stress on the animals. After the eye cover is in place, the pronghorn is turned upright on its brisket. This position helps handlers keep track of the antelope's legs. One kick from those powerhouses could cause some serious damage to an unsuspecting handler. The majority of pronghorn were ear tagged to aid wildlife managers in identifying specific animals from a distance. Eight were also fitted with telemetry collars to help managers locate herds. This will allow department researchers to understand the types of habitat the pronghorn are using, whether they remain near the location site, and how the herd does over time. Two veterinarians experienced in wildlife capture and handling were on site to assess the health and help assure the safety of the animals, and to bind a broken finger or two. That really feels good. Okay, move that finger. Come on, come on down here. Um, you know, most of my patients are animals, but in this case, we'll work on primates. Tell me what the injury was. Well, 
I, I clotheslined a little yearling buck, and in my this finger got bent, laced in the netting. Okay. Yeah, and got bent. Sorry, buddy. Ladder. It's gonna hurt. That's okay. That's small enough. In all capture and relocation efforts, there is an inherent risk of injury and even mortality to the captured animals. Thanks to the experience and dedication of the capture crew, this risk is greatly reduced. Veterinarians on the scene were able to perform field surgery on serious gashes, greatly increasing any injured pronghorn's chances for survival. I can't tell the hair from the suture. Loading up a drug called haloperidol for these uh, antelope. It's a drug that's been used quite extensively in human medicine as an anti-anxiety medication. We found applications for it in wildlife medicine as well. This drug lasts about 18 to 24 hours in these animals. It, all it does is simply take the edge off of them. They just don't care what happens to them for about a day. And it's not a sedative, it's not a tranquilizer, they don't go under anesthesia. They simply just don't care. And that's what we want these guys to do. For all captured animals, fluids were administered, blood drawn to test herd's overall health, and each animal received a series of okay. shots. Pronghorn antelope evolved on the plains of northern, uh, North America in the Neoplastocene era and was chased by the giant cheetah. Therefore, it's an animal that's very reactive. It doesn't accept its fate very easily and they stress very easily and consequently are uh, subject to different diseases, most commonly capture myopathy. So the drugs we're giving these guys today are a combination of an anti-anxiety medication where it doesn't sedate them, but it keeps them nice and calm for the, for the duration of their travel, and an antibiotic to help for the infections, as well as medication that helps prevent capture myopathy, vitamins, minerals, things like that. Leave that one alone where it is. Lisa Schender, wildlife disease specialist and veterinarian, also conducted ultrasounds on does to see which females were carrying fawns. Once all the procedures are complete and the pronghorn are loaded onto the trailer, the next batch is let in for processing. While capture and release operations like this are manpower intensive, we weren't at a loss for volunteers. Yeah, actually it's really easy to get volunteers. We put the word out and people seem to show up for the capture. It's really a kind of an interesting thing for people to see and do. Um, we've got some volunteers here from the Arizona Antelope Foundation and some, from some of the National Wild Turkey Federation groups that are here local. Um, we also have a, a local HBC chapter here in Prescott. We've got some members from that. And it's basically anyone that got the word of mouth. We really didn't advertise much. And as you can see, if you look around, we've probably got 100 volunteers or so. so. This young lady grabbed herself a front row seat to take in all the action. She'll have an exciting story for show and tell. The capture operation went smoothly and quickly, with all 67 animals caught and processed the same day. Excess animals, including some impressive bucks, were released on site. Once the trailer was full and headed for the meteor crater area, the doors were opened and the pronghorn got their first look at their new home. The Vermilion Cliffs in the farthest reaches of northern Arizona are not only beautiful, but they're usually a quiet and serene place as well. But not on this afternoon in early March. Atop the cliffs is the California Condor Release Site, and it's teaming with activity. Woo! It's a big bird. 
316. Chris Parrish heads the California Condor Project in Arizona, and today he and his staff of biologists are attaching transmitters to the bird's huge wings. This way they can keep track of them when they're released into the wild. This bird has been out before, so we're, we're going to put a, a new transmitter on this bird's right wing and enable us to keep a closer eye on her when she's out and about. She's been one that uh, we've had some problems with as far as not being wary enough around humans. Around, and it seems inevitably when you couple that with uh, human's normal curiosity at the Grand Canyon or somewhere like that, that uh, usually leads to a bird being fed. So we want to make sure that that doesn't happen. The California condor is one of the most endangered birds in the world and also one of the most social and curious. That natural curiosity can lead to interactions with humans, which is the type of behavior these biologists are trying to discourage. You're not necessarily changing a bird's behavior, yeah. I don't believe, you're, you're disrupting a pattern of yeah. behavior. And as they mature, their patterns of behavior change. The California condor was placed on the endangered species list in 1967. They had not been seen in Arizona since the beginning of the 20th century. As a result of the continued downward spiral of the condor population in the 1980s, one of the longest wildlife recovery efforts began. On the Southern California coast, only a small stronghold of 22 birds were left in the wild. In 1987, the decision was made to capture all of the birds and concentrate on a captive breeding program in an effort to save the species. Experts at the Los Angeles and San Diego zoos and the Peregrine Fund's breeding facility in Boise, Idaho have produced hundreds of young condors. In 1992 in California and in 1996 in Arizona, they began releasing birds back into the wild. So these birds are being prepared for their release the next day. Tomorrow there'll be a total of seven, four of which have been out before, so three additional to the population that'll bring the Arizona population to 60 birds. The day has finally arrived, and with everyone in place, Big ten four. All right, door is ready. The gate is raised, and the birds are free to leave whenever they choose. The four birds that have been released before don't hesitate to take flight. But for the three new birds, taking that first step off of a thousand foot cliff, well that requires a little more thought. You gotta imagine it, for some of these birds, uh, it's the first time they've taken to the air outside of a pen. And although our flight pen is fairly large so that they develop the muscle uh, that they will need to be able to, to fly with flapping flight as well as the gliding that they normally do, when they take to the air and, and uh, rise up over this thousand foot cliff, that's, that's got to be a, a whole new world for them. And some of them do catch the wind and just yeah. take off. And we've seen them go down around the corner, you know, nine, ten miles around the corner and sit by themselves for a few days. And you got to wonder yeah. at that point, too, what's, uh, you know, what's going through a bird's mind. But the thing is, they're, they're such a social species that um, uh, the group that's tied here, and that's why we do the release this time of year, because we still have birds um, here at the release site. So even when they leave, however, the younger ones will, will stick around um, for sometimes as long as a year. But as the population gains more and more confidence and, and kind of uh, utilizes their, what we now assume is this 50 to 70 mile home range, younger birds are, are more quickly going with them to the South Rim, for example, or on the Kaibab Plateau. So it seems like they're really uh, becoming to be developed into, into what we think is their normal, going to be their normal behavior. Slowly, one at a time, the other birds make their way through the gate and out to freedom, until there is only one left. Finally, after a few more practice runs in the large pen, 
and with the sight of the other condors flying overhead, mm -hmm. bird number 327 leaves the nest. 327 is out, Frank. Condors are the largest of all North American soaring birds, and the Vermilion Cliffs area is a wonderland of air currents giving them an easy, energy-saving way to travel. These currents rise from expanses of bare rock that warm in the sunshine and create air pressure differences across the landscape. Prevailing southwesterly winds deflected upward by the steep slopes and cliff faces form natural elevators for condors to tower upon. And then, with their nine-foot wingspan, they easily glide to the next updraft. These cliffs also provide lofty perches, not only offering expansive views for these sharp-eyed scavengers, but also cavities for nesting safely isolated from predators. Meanwhile, back on the ground, biologists keep a close watch on the newest members of the Arizona flock. So for the first couple of weeks, uh, specifically the first you know, four to five days after release, um, we'll watch these birds and make sure they're in good roosting positions. And uh, basically a good roosting dis uh, position defined by anything that a, that a coyote can't get into uh, for the first couple of weeks is... Uh, in the early years, that was one of our, our leading causes of death, was predation by coyotes and golden eagles. And it's basically inexperienced for the birds, but these birds, now that we're releasing into this existing flock, they're, um, they benefit from the rest of the flock. So now that we have uh, quite a few birds out there that are very savvy, that have been out for years, um, if they follow those birds around and learn from them, it's a little, little sharper learning curve. Another nemesis of the condor has been lead poisoning. Since condors are scavengers who like to feed in groups, research has shown that one of the main sources of lead exposure is from lead ammunition fragments in animal carcasses left in the field. The Arizona Game and Fish Department has responded to these findings by offering non-lead ammunition to hunters who draw deer permits on the Kaibab Plateau. The department supports the condor reintroduction program as part of its basic mission to care for the wildlife of Arizona. We support the program 100 percent, but we supply both, both personnel, we supply uh, resources, and we supply other funding to the program. Uh, we also cooperate in the program uh, in other ways, such as the voluntary uh, non-lead bullet program uh, uh, that we've been using now for about three years. Once they were informed, the majority of hunters responded enthusiastically by using lead-free copper bullets during their hunts in condor territory, and almost all agreed that they performed as well, if not better, than lead ammunition. But today, the focus is on condor numbers 366, 368, and 327 as they adjust to their new life in the wild. First couple hours, these, these birds have done wonderful. I mean, they're flying about as, as if they've uh, flown before, and, and for the three new birds, they haven't, obviously, but and holding them a bit longer makes a big difference. And up top of the release pin, they're seeing other free-flying birds coming and going, and uh, they have time enough to flap back and forth in the 60-foot flight pan and, and uh, develop some of the muscles that they'll need. But uh, still yet, it's got to be quite a shock when they leave the release pan and it's about a thousand foot drop of the cliff face there. and uh, takes them a little bit, but these, these birds are looking good. The addition of these three new condors brings the Arizona population to 60, but the program won't be considered a true success until it reaches a self-sustaining population of about 150 birds. But with the continued dedication of agencies like the Peregrine Fund, the Arizona Game and Fish Department, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and many other groups and individuals, these magnificent birds are well on their way to recovery. Bighorn sheep uh, release here today 
and we are literally 15 miles from nothing in some pretty wild country. Uh, nothing, by the way, is one of the cities here in, in Arizona. We're actually within the Aquarius mountain range and uh, we're in uh, unit 18B. This is some of the habitat that's been evaluated uh, by our department biologists and we're trying to reestablish a uh, bighorn sheep population here uh, for future generations. 15 miles from nothing is also known as Hell's Half Acre. Now that may not sound like much of a destination choice to us, but to desert bighorn sheep, this place is a little slice of heaven. Well, this particular area we're in today is, is called Hell's Half Acre, and that probably is a little bit self-explanatory what bighorn sheep like. They, you know, they're, they're adapted to extremely rough terrain. Um, they typically like to stay within 300 yards of escape terrain, which is greater than a 60% slope. Their eyesight is, is adapted so they can see predators from a distance, and then they use that ability. They have soft, spongy hoofs that allow them to um, climb on very steep rocky areas and so when they see predators coming they, they run to those steep areas and can escape um, predators. These 25 sheep have had a long but fast journey to get here. Only one day ago they were captured in the Virgin River Gorge up in extreme northwestern Arizona. They were then placed in these large crates and driven to an area near the release site. From here they get to fly the rest of the way. We've got the helicopter coming in. What we're going to use is that helicopter to transport these boxes back out to the uh, actual release site. We use a long line, hook it onto the uh, boxes, and we'll be transporting them out to the release site, which is actually about two miles from where we're standing right here. box contains several bighorn sheep and great care is taken to make sure they all arrive in their new home safely. Using a helicopter reduces the stress on the sheep by avoiding taking them on a long bumpy truck ride across very rough terrain where they might be injured. This way the worst effect on them might be they arrive a little dizzy. Flying also allows them to be placed in a more remote location. The Arizona Game and Fish Department worked closely with the Bureau of Land Management and the Desert Bighorn Sheep Society to make this transfer possible. So why is it important that Desert Bighorn Sheep be moved to this area? Well, it's written right into our mission for the Arizona Game and Fish Department is to restore uh, native wildlife populations and that's part of our strategic plans and so where we feel like that we had historic populations and we have suit suitable habitat and um, we try to make those efforts to bring wildlife back in to, to have the native wildlife. So. Bighorn sheep used to occupy this habitat. We lost them uh, a little over a hundred years ago, early explorers journals and things we, they talk about this possibly being one of the densest sheep populations in the state but when the west was being settled things became difficult for the desert bighorn sheep new residents brought domestic goats and sheep with them that carried diseases the native bighorn sheep had little or no resistance to this along with unregulated hunting virtually wiped them out in all but the most remote areas of the state it's important to recognize that we should not confuse that with the regulated hunting or the regulated uh, livestock operations that are occurring today for the most part. Um, things are much better today than they were then, but we're still in the process of trying to reestablish these populations in places where they were, were um, extirpated as a result of historic events. To help protect the bighorn sheep from diseases in the future, Federal guidelines now state that no domestic sheep or goats are allowed within nine miles of native bighorn sheep populations. We've got a uh, mix of rams and ewes, males and females within this uh, group. Basically we have four adult males and about uh, 23 adult females plus one ram lamb. And what our hope is is these animals are going to get out there, form the nucleus of this population and uh, kind of get this thing off to a great start. 
Desert bighorn females weigh an average of 110 pounds, while males can weigh up to 200 pounds. The biggest visual difference between the two sexes is their horns. Ewe horns are generally 10 to 13 inches long with a circumference of 5 to 6 inches. Ram horns may measure 30 to 40 inches along the outside curl with a circumference of 13 to 15 inches. The horn core is honeycombed with chambers or sinuses which reduce the weight on the skull. Biologists like Jeff Pebworth and Brian Wakeling take a great deal of satisfaction in returning home a species that has been absent from this landscape for nearly a century. Yeah, it's terrific. I mean, it's, it's really great to be part of this. We've got a number of people here working today that, that worked in this region, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, and they actually started this process. And so now they're here today and they're actually seeing it come together. So I think it's great for a lot of us. Plus, we have actually brand new people, the first time they've ever been on these transplants. So we're all getting a lot of satisfaction from seeing this occur. It's a great effort. For more information on anything you've seen on our show, go to our website, azgfd.gov.